All right. Well, that's the point. That's one for the uh, Today is the Super Bowl, so if you follow football, uh, today is one of the biggest sporting events in America. Uh, so whether you don't follow football or not, uh, there is a Super Bowl, Super Bowl party at my place right after church. So if you want to come and root for whoever, uh, you're more than welcome to come. Today's one of those happy, sad moments um, because they both have a common denominator. <laughs> so you're asking, what am I talking about? Well, today is Linda's last day, Linda and Justin's last day, uh, as, uh, they, as Linda goes to Germany. Uh, and she's, uh, and they're coming here, uh, and so today is sort of like a farewell, uh, uh, we pray for them and, and wish them well wherever they go. But then again, it's also happy because Linda's back from Hawaii. <laughs> so one of those sad, happy, well she's not back here uh, forever, uh, she's just here for about two weeks. Uh, so, uh, yeah, both Linda's, <laughs> awesome. Uh, so, whatever happens today. <laughs> Whatever right, happens today, you can be sad for Linda and then be happy for Linda. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, we wish uh, both of them, uh, yeah, both of you two, that you head out to see what God's going to do the next thing in your life. We'll pray for you guys at the end of the service. Um, so today I want to talk to you. Uh, last week we talked about the thirst of God, uh, being thirsty for God. And I'm so, so glad they ate this water bottle. Oh, shit, that was again. <laughs> But we talked about being thirsty for God, that Jesus is the living water, and that, you know, when we, when we live our lives for Christ, He, he satisfies our thirst, He, he uh, satisfies our need. Nothing in this world will ever substitute in place of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and physically, you can say Coca-Cola, Gatorade, is not going to satisfy your thirst. Only true water will, will satisfy your thirst. And that we ought to be thirsty for God. As believers, we ought to stay thirsty for God. We need to hunger for God. I wonder, I'm wondering if some of you were lately or maybe in your life or have you ever come to church? Have you ever come to church looking for nothing? You know, a lot of times we come to church looking for nothing. And I'm going to tell you what, if you come to church looking for nothing, I guarantee you, you're going to learn nothing. Every time you will walk out of here not knowing nothing. You ought to come to church hungry, thirsty, seeking, and knocking. When you come to church in that manner, with that attitude, God will deliver. God will show up. God will speak to your heart. But you ought to come with that attitude. You ought to come with that humbleness. You ought to come with that reverence towards God. When you enter this worship center, when you enter this building, you're walking into the presence of God. We ought to show respect to our God by listening to what He has had, what He has for us to know. We shouldn't walk in these doors otherwise. We ought to come in here ready to worship God. And I want to talk to you today about this. The most important, powerful thing in this universe for a Christian is prayer. I know we talked about prayer many times. I'm sure you heard many sermons about prayer, what to pray for, how to pray. But I want to talk to you today, this afternoon, about having a prayer that has power. Prayer that has power. If you have your Bibles with you, open to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 13 all the way to 18. You see, whatever you think about prayer, whatever your knowledge about prayer, I'm here to tell you that we know that the reason why we pray, the reason why we go before the Lord in prayer is that it's not that we change God's attitude, but through our prayer, our attitudes get changed. But I'm willing to go a little bit further. I'm literally, I'm literally, I want to say that there is something that through powerful prayer, you can move the hand of God. 
All right? I'm not saying that you can change God's mind. I'm not saying that through prayer you're going to change God's will. But you can have power to change and move, uh, or to move God's hand. Let me ask you. Let me tell you a reason why I believe that. If you ever read the Old Testament, God was furious <coughs> with the Israelites. And he said, I'm going to strike down the Israelites. I'm going to kill them. But Moses said, plead it with the Lord. I pray, please do not do that. God changed his mind. So I'm willing to bet that if we pray, and there's certain aspects, there's certain types of things that we ought to do, that when we pray with power, God's hand will move. James chapter 5 starts in verse 12. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great, what? Power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. You see, when we pray, I want you to know that Hebrews tells us in chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Let us then come with confidence, drawing near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in need of time. When we pray, when we pray in the presence, we are going before our Heavenly Father. We're in the presence of Him. So how can we have this power of prayer? The first thing that we ought to do, in verse 17 says it, and James uses the illustration of Elijah he prayed. The first thing you got to do is pray. You got to start praying. I'm wondering how many of you pray. Well, what do you pray for? What is you, what do you pray daily? Do you pray for meals? Do you pray for your life? Do you pray for career? Do you pray for direction? Which is not bad. But do you find yourself constantly praying for the same thing? And how long do you pray for? You see, a pastor once said this, I never met anybody who had a great prayer life, a great prayer life without a prayer list. I think it's so important that we believers start having a prayer list. We ought to start praying with a prayer list. Why do I say that? Actually, this, all, this kind of cut to me when I heard that pastor say, do you have a prayer list? And I thought to myself, no, I don't. And then I thought to myself, why do, we, why do I need a prayer list? And I realized that without a prayer list, a lot of our prayers are just simply broad. A lot of our prayer list, a lot of things that we pray for are just surface level. I found myself praying, like, this is what I will pray. Lord, especially I'm praying for my wife. I'll say, Lord, be with my wife. Be there for her help. Lord, be there for be there while she goes to work. Lord, be there uh, that she will be a better mother, a better husband, a better, better mother, better wife. And I thought, and I'm praying that prayer. And I realized that I'm just praying very surface level. It's easy. It's quick. It's fast. When that pastor said that you ought to have a prayer list, I wondered why, and it dawned on me. When I have a prayer list, it gets specific. It gets detailed. You see, I'm almost betting that God is that same character. Is that when we come to God in prayer, we ought to be specific and detailed. Why do I say that? As I was reading the Word of God, as I started this year to read the Bible again, over, from, from beginning to the end. You know, every time you do that, I want, I want to let you know, every time you read it, every time you read it, it's always a different conviction that you get. You know the conviction that I got as I was reading from Genesis? I'm at Numbers right now. 
But as I was reading, I realized how specific and how detailed and how meticulous God is. And there's no other way around it. In fact, if you, go, if you don't believe me, go back and read Leviticus and how detailed he was and how mannerism, like you say, you better do this in this specific way. And guess what? If you don't, and he commands it. And if God is that way, don't you think that our prayer life should be specific and detailed? To be specific, you begin to write down your prayer request and you divide it, you dissect it. So, so now let me just give you an example. When I pray for my wife, I say, Lord, be there for her health. She has been having stomach issues when she eats. Her body aches from head to toe from working in front of a computer all day. Be there for her eyes so that her eyes will not get worse because she's in front of a computer. Be there for, for her, for her uh, overall uh, physical muscles as she continues to work. And not just that, but give her life to her children. I began to say, Lord, as she goes to work, help her to get there safely. Be with the car that she's in. Be with the wheels that will not get flat. Lord, be, be there for the other drivers so that they'll be aware of my wife wherever she's going. Do you understand? When you become specific and when you begin to get really down and dissect your prayer, it becomes not just a, a, a lengthy prayer, but it becomes a passionate prayer. It becomes passionate. Not for just not just passionate before your God, but becomes passionate with the person that you're praying for. There's a big difference when you pray for things broadly and when you pray things specifically. And I'm telling you right now, you cannot be specific without a prayer list. You ought to have a prayer list. You ought to go buy a book and begin a prayer list. You want to have a powerful prayer? Begin a list. Begin a list and write those things down and be specific and ask for each one. Not only do you become specific, I want to also throw in there on that list, miracle prayers. God is the miracle God. God can do anything. Nothing's impossible to him. So why don't you put a few things in your prayer list that's impossible and see how God works and see how God will answer that. You see, you know what's not in the Bible? 10 miracles a day or 10 miracles only list. The Bible has no limit. The Bible, the Bible has no limit of how much miracle prayers you can ask God. You know why I think you should put a miracle list on your prayer list? It's because when you have that and you're looking for that and it's impossible, then you begin to pray more for that specific thing. It keeps you accountable. Put a miracle prayer request on there. <coughs> Not only do you ought to start praying. The second thing to a powerful prayer is to pray earnestly. To pray with fervence. Fervently. Well, fervently. fervently. Look at it right here in verse 17. Elijah was a man like our nature, like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. What does it mean to be earnest? What does it mean to be fervent? It means to have showing great warmth or intensity, intensity of spirit, feeling enthusiasm, basically to pour into it with intensity. When you pray, do you pray with fervency? Do you pray with earnestly? Do you pray with immense, intense spiritual feeling before the Lord? You get into your prayers, basically what it's saying. Now, I want you to be quite clear on this. I'm not, I don't want you to confuse with this idea about that when you pray, you ought to shout and scream, ah, I'm going to go crazy. In fact, when I was in college, I remember when I was trying to give my life back to the Lord, this is before I met Sister Emma, uh, I went to a, a revival, and right next to me was this young man uh, praying. It was a revival, and he stood up, and began, everything started to fall apart. He was, you know, pray out loud, and he was saying, oh, Lord, God, you're amazing. You're good. Oh Lord, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a sinner, whatever. And all of a sudden, he starts to start screaming, "Oh God, please forgive me!" And then he starts banging on the chair, and he begins to not just bang, and all of a sudden, he starts shaking the chair, and he's like going crazy. And I'm just sitting there, like, "Oh my 
this, I couldn't pray with this guy. Now, if that's the way he wants to pray, so be it. But you don't, if you don't pray, here's the thing, if you don't pray like that, it doesn't mean that God's not listening to your prayer. All right, you can have the same intensity with a silent prayer. How do I know? Look at the story in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12. It's the story of Hannah, mother of Samuel. Listen to what Eli was saying. 1 Samuel 1, 12. It says here, Hannah, as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her month. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. So here's Hannah praying with her heart. Her lips are moving, but there's no voice coming out. And when Eli looked at it, the priest was looking at it, she must be drunk. And Eli, verse 14, said to her, how long will you be going on to be drunk? Put your wine away, woman. 15, but Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I'm a woman in troubled spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink. Listen to this very next words. It says, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. She prayed silently, but her heart was pouring out from her, from her soul. So much that people were looking at her, even though her voice wasn't saying anything, people knew that something was going wild in her because she was fervently praying before God. When was the last time you fervently prayed to God? When was the last time you shouted out to God? When was the last time you got down on your knees and you cried before the Lord? When was the last time you surrendered all to, your, to God and to ask God to listen to your prayers? When was the last time you did that? You want powerful prayer? This is what you got to do. It's so easy for us. Pretty soon, we're going to be going to our house, my house, and we're going to be shouting for either the Broncos or the Panthers. None of us have trouble being fervently we're, 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 we're enthusiastic about a sports team. How much more should we be more ecstatic for prayer in our lives? I'm telling you right now, prayer is important in our heart, in our lives. Dr. John R. Rice, his book <coughs> called Prayer, Asking and Receiving said this, quote, every failure in a Christian life, every failure in a Christian life is a prayer failure. Every failure to a Christian is a prayer failure. Are you praying and asking? Are you praying Fervently, Charles Spurgeon also said this, he who prays without fervency does not pray at all. We ought to pray, seeking, asking, fervently. If you want powerful prayer, if you want to see God's hand move, you want to see a difference, you want to see something change, you want to see something amazing, pray, Ask with fervency. The third thing to have a powerful prayer is you've got to get clean. You've got to get clean. Look at verse 16, right, the verse right above uh, 17, obviously. It says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. <clears throat> that you may be healed. And look at that last sentence. The prayer of a righteous person has a great power and is working. You want your power, I mean, you want your prayers to have power, you ought to be clean. You got to come clean. Now there's a difference. Whenever we have an altar call, whenever I ask you to pray before the Lord, a lot of us come and we pray to get cleaner. We come and say, Lord, we just want to be cleaner. No, we ought to come and pray, I want to be clean. Not cleaner, but clean. Because a righteous man has great power in his prayer. D.L. Moody on his church wall says this on a plaque. Do not leave this place until you get clean. You see, when we come to church, we ought to come in a, in a way where we come before the Lord and we get clean. 100%. This is like a, a bathhouse, if you want to call it. You want to come here, get your spa going on, get your prayer going on, get all that nasty toxins out of your body. Because why? For the next whole week, you got to endure all that stuff in the world with all your co-workers, with all your other family members. 
This is the place to come on Sunday to come and get clean and start your week off the right way and go off. If you don't become clean, if you don't become righteous, your prayer has no power. No power. There's a story of this Christian lawyer in California who is representing a pastor in court. He didn't say what the pastor was in for, but he did say that it wasn't going well. The jurors of the court, all 12 of them, began to really press hard upon the pastor really was going to convict him of being guilty. The judge was also not in the pastor's favor and began to really make things difficult. The lawyer thought to himself, surely we're going to lose this case. That night, that pastor called the lawyer into his hotel room. The lawyer came in, opened the door, and the pastor was sitting on his bed with all these bunch of papers on his bed. And the lawyer thought to himself, oh man, is he doing some research? He asked, uh, what's all those papers? You doing some research? You trying to find some evidence, find somewhere? He said, no, these are all my prayer list. This is all my prayer I make a prayer list and these are my things I'm praying for. So once you, and he said, he told the lawyer, why don't you come in this bed? Let's pray. And the lawyer thought, well, okay, that's kind of awkward. Okay, because so he sat down and he began to say, okay, let's pray uh, that God has favor on our, on our case. Let's pray that the jury will fight against each other. Let's pray that the judge will get sick and go, go to the hospital. And the lawyer's thinking, so that's kind of harsh, right? And, like, and, then, and then he said, but most importantly, you know, he goes, you know what? I know you've been praying. I know I've been praying, but God hasn't been answering. I think I know why. And the pastor's like, what? He goes, because we need to get down on our knees and we need to confess. We need to come clean before the Lord. And the lawyer's like, okay. And he goes, once you go to that corner and you just start yelling out all the sins that you committed. I'm going to go in this corner and I'm going to start yelling out all the things that I've done. And then we'll come back and we'll pray together. And the lawyer's like, okay. So he said, he went to the corner and he said, he was thinking of like, it's like, okay, Lord, uh, well, how, can I, how can I say this? And all of a sudden the pastor starts going off. Lord, forgive me of this. And he was specific. I've been doing this and this and this. And the lawyer was so shocked. <laughs> He's like, I was hearing the pastor's prayer and I was like, oh my goodness. Oh man, I didn't know that, you know. But the, but the pastor was coming out clean. He was confessing. And the Lord admitted that after hearing his prayer, he began to get really down. And he started to name one by one the things that he started, that he committed in his heart. And he started to come out clean. And he started asking for forgiveness. And sure enough, he said that he was bawling, crying. And they got together and they prayed together. They prayed for one another. And guess what happened the next day? The lawyer said they went to court the next day. And the jury came with this decision. And right before the judge, the juror said, we can't find an agreement with the other 12. And we, we have to dismiss the case because we're all fighting with each other. So the judge had no choice but to dismiss the case. And the case was closed. And the Lord looked at the pastor and said, okay, let's help him get out of here. The why? I don't want the ambulance to come. <laughs> because the judge was the same judge. Then. Anyways, but the, the, the power of prayer really did work. This is what he said, that he realized that when he came clean, God had the power to answer their prayers. We ought to come clean before the Lord. You got to got you guys got to in your in your room in the corner of somewhere you need to come and lay out your sin and lay out what you're doing wrong. If you want to see powerful prayer, you got to pray, asking, you got to pray with fervency, and you got to come clean. And the last thing is this: if you want powerful prayer, you got to stay praying. You've got to stay praying. Look at verse 18. It says here, Elijah prayed again. Then he prayed again for the heavens to open up. Elijah prayed again. 
The reason why James used Elijah, you got to go back to 1 Kings chapter 18, and you see the story where Elijah just defeated the prophets of Baal, and there was no rain in the area, and Elijah came and he prayed on top of Mount Carmel and said, Lord, send us rain. And he sent out a servant. The servant went out to the top of the mountain and said, there's no sign of rain. So Elijah prayed again and he prayed and he sent out the servant. Not just once, not just twice, not just, not just three times, four times, five times, six times, but seven times Elijah prayed and sent out his servant. And on the seventh day, the servant looked out and saw a small cloud, a dark cloud, a cloud coming of the mist to bring rain. Elijah didn't give up. He stayed praying. You see, a lot of us, I believe, when we pray for something, and when God answers, we're like, oh, good, and you stop praying. If you want to have power behind your prayer, you want to see God's hand move, you got to pray continuously. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. You've got to to stick with it. Through thick and thin, no matter what, prayer should not be absent from your life. Every day, no matter how difficult your life is, no matter how difficult things are going, prayer should not be absent from your life. You've got to have prayer because it's the most important thing in a Christian life. I end with this one story again. A story about this man, this guest speaker who went to go speak at a church, this old country church. And he went in there and he preached the gospel and people were giving their lives and all of a sudden from the back, this man, rough looking man came, tattoos all over his body, rough looking man. And as he was walking down the aisle, people began to shout, people began to dance, people began to rejoice. And the guy came up and gave his life to Christ. And he was so shocked to see the, the amount of people so excited, so excited about it. So he asked his pastor, what is going on with this? Why is your members going all crazy? And the pastor said, oh, pastor, you don't know. For the last so many years, we've been trying to reach this man. Some of our members will go to the front porch and he will come out with a shotgun. You know, some of us will come over there and he would yell at us and curse at us and, and, move, and then just do mass, nasty things to us. Um, and anytime we try to go over there, there's something wrong that happened. And he was so angry and so furious. And the pastor said, oh, no wonder you guys are so excited. He goes, but pastor, that's not the reason why we're excited. He's like, what do you mean? Yeah, yes, we're excited that he gave his life, but there's something even more. So what? You see that lady in the pew right there? Yeah, the old lady there that's hunched down praying? Yeah, that's his mother. And for the last 10 years, every single Sunday, she will sit there in that exact same position and pray for her son. Her son's salvation. This is the reason why we're rejoicing. Because of that woman's faithfulness in prayer. She never gave up in prayer. She had power to move God's hand, to touch her son, to get saved. I've seen it with my own eyes. I see the power of God's hand when people pray. My grandmother was a heavy shamanist believer. A shamanist is a religion in Korea. Every time I say the name of Jesus, every time my mom would witness to her, my grandmother would get angry and spit and yell and curse. My mother prayed for my grandmother for 20 years straight for my grandmother's salvation. 20 years straight, every single day. It was on my mother's prayer list. Every single morning she gets up, prayed for my grandmother's salvation. And my grandmother got saved at the age of 77 years old. She gave her life to Christ because of my mother's faithfulness in prayer. You want to have a powerful prayer? You want to have a, a prayer that's powerful and to see God's hand move? You want to move mountains? 
You want to see God's miracles. You want to be able to pray and see things, crazy things happen. You got to pray. You got to ask. You got to pray with intensity. You got to pray with, uh, with, with the mind of getting clean. And you got to stick with it. You got to pray without ceasing. I'm telling you, you do this, you will have a powerful prayer. And your life will change. I guarantee you. Take notes. Take this. And pray. A powerful prayer. Let's pray.